Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, I see that there are a few people who have joined by phone. Thank you for joining. Um, if you were having trouble logging on and you wanted to join via a computer, you can click the date on the website. Um, so if you're on the La Alma Lincoln Park website, the date will take you to the Zoom meeting um, so that you can see it on the screen. If you'd like to do that, please feel free to join that way as well. And so anyways, thank you so much. We appreciate you all joining. This is our second community meeting for the La Alma Lincoln Park proposed uh, historic cultural district. And so I wanted to welcome everyone to the meeting um, and talk a little bit about how we're going to set this up. If you have any questions, you can raise your hand or click, I believe it shows on this screen a Q&A, but it's also a chat on this particular Zoom feature. If you have any questions, please feel free to enter any of your questions there. Uh, staff is going to provide a presentation and then um, we will open it up for Q&A. Um, when you're asking your questions, please be brief to allow um, more people the opportunity to speak. And most importantly, we want to um, remind everyone to please be respectful of the attendees and the residents in the district to avoid um, obscenities and hurtful language in any questions that may be asked. And wanted to remind everyone that this community meeting um, is being recorded and will be added to our website. Wanted to go over a little bit of what we're gonna talk about today. So uh, myself, as well as a couple of other landmark staff are going to provide you with a, a presentation. We're going to do a little bit of an introduction to landmark talk a little bit about the outreach and process, uh, talk about the significance of the La Alma Lincoln Park, the designation application, and then talk about the customized design guidelines that go along with that, followed by a Q&A section. And so I will um, turn this over to my colleague, Abby, to go over the landmark overview. Hey, good morning. Thank you for joining. I'm just going to do a brief introduction, give you an idea of what Landmark is, what we do. So the Landmark Preservation Ordinance that established Landmark Preservation was passed in 1967. So Landmark's been around for over 50 years now. It was one of the earlier city preservation programs of so the National Preservation um, kind of Act was passed in 1966. So Denver passed their ordinance just a year after that. So the purpose at the time when it was established to designate, preserve, and protect our historic structures, foster civic pride, stabilize and improve aesthetic and economic vitality, and promote good urban design. And over those you know, more than 50 years now that we have been doing historic preservation in Denver, that's evolved quite a bit. Um, so kind of have a broader definition today of why we preserve. So a lot of different reasons, motivations, a lot of this kind of come together. People may have different reasons why they're interested in designation for their community. So some of the many reasons to protect the character of our city and our neighborhoods, to share the history and the stories of the neighborhood, to celebrate what's happened somewhere, or to commemorate something new. Know, celebrate the good, commemorate the unfortunate, um, to honor what's happened in the past, for environmental reasons, to reuse our historic buildings and to be more sustainable rather than you know, demolishing and having buildings end up in landfills to educate, to, you know, again, to be able to tell the story of what happened, to connect with the past, to remember what happened, to be inclusive and try to tell the story of everyone who has lived in Denver and all the variety and diversity of communities and people who've contributed to Denver's history, um, to instill pride and to retain a sense of place. So history is your story. And just gonna, so this is a map to give you an idea of what is currently designated in Denver. So we currently have 352 individual landmarks. 
and we have 56 historic districts. Some of those only include a few structures, some are quite expansive. So the colored areas on the, the map give you an idea of the districts, um, the individual dots, those are the individual landmarks, the other colored areas of districts. Uh, so we have a total of around 6,800 buildings that have some form of designation. That may sound like a lot, but that is only about 4% of Denver's built environment. And we do so far have one cultural district, uh, the Five Points District. So if this district, we call, you know, if this district is passed and becomes designated, it would join as our second cultural district. So brief overview of some of the benefits of designation before we get into other details. So local districts give communities a voice in their future. So community designations come from the community. This wasn't you know, the city's staff. We didn't decide we want this district. This nomination did come from the community. Uh, property values have been shown to be more stable in historic districts. There's also more development predictability. You know what, you know, that there's not going to be a giant structure constructed next door to you because everything will, you know, within a district will have, you know, need to fit the guidelines, be similar in mass and proportion and scale to what is there currently. Um, organizations within the district. So nonprofits, other are, are able to apply for Colorado State Historical Fund grants. Individual residents are able to apply for Colorado Historic Rehabilitation Tax Credits. So that includes work like if you need to updo um, your plumbing, your electrical, your HVAC, all that type of work would qualify for the tax credits as well as any restoration and repair if you needed to repoint your brick, put on a new roof, stabilize your foundation. Those types of projects would be eligible for the tax credit program. And that the residential tax credits are also run through our office. So you would apply to us for those as well. Uh, designation also encourages the reuse of existing buildings with less building waste and landfills. And it has the social and psychological benefits of living in a human scale environment. And I will pass this over to my colleagues. Thanks, Abby. Uh, so um, my name is Kara Hahn, and I work primarily uh, doing designations for landmark preservation in community planning and development. And wanted to talk to you a little bit about how we got to this point with them, um, having these outreach meetings and some of the significance of the Little Alma Lincoln Park community. So this started out uh, through residents of the neighborhood. Uh, they decided they wanted to come forward and talk about what's the history of our neighborhood, what's the history of our community, um, and do we want to start talking about a possible historic or historic cultural district. Uh, residents did some preliminary research and outreach. Uh, they then applied to Historic Denver. Uh, historic Denver is the local nonprofit preservation group for Denver, uh, and they applied for their action fund. And so uh, with the action fund at Historic Denver, uh, there was a grant to help write the history of the community um, and to get some aid from uh, Historic Denver staff to help, to help them through the process. As uh, the community was researching and uh, completing the historic context or the history of the neighborhood, uh, they did a series of oral histories and interviews with both current and former residents to understand the history of the community. They also did some pretty extensive outreach from about 2017 on. Uh, there's been a series of neighborhood engagements. There were listening sessions, community meetings, uh, walking tours, as you saw on the previous slide, there were walking tours, ice cream socials and flyers. Um, they went door to door delivering um, several flyers throughout the time period. Um, and if there anyone has any more questions uh, at the end, we can open that up to um, Jane and Sage at Historic Denver or any of the residents to talk about that. And then I, working for the city, wanted to give you guys a little bit of a sense of the designation process and where we're at. Um, so it started here with a pre-op meeting with Landmark staff. So they, the community members met with Landmark staff, talked about is there potential for a historic district. Uh, the community and neighborhood um, 
did a lot of outreach, talked to the community. Is this something we want to go forward with? Uh, they researched and prepared the history of the neighborhood. Um, and then they uh, recently, um, about a month and a half ago, submitted a designation application to our office. And this is where we are right now, hosting um, a series of community meetings and office hours with the community to talk about what does this process mean. Uh, you guys will be receiving in the next couple of weeks um, a letter from the city and county of Denver talking about the upcoming adoption process, um, which would start with the Landmark Preservation Commission review. It would also go to Denver Planning Board, and if recommended forwarded by the commission, it would go to city council for their review. All designations um, are decided by Denver City Council. Uh, there will be a series of community meetings and public hearings where the community has the opportunity to provide their input and voice in the process. And it will be ultimately determined by city council um, with an adoption process likely late this summer. So we also, we wanted to talk with everyone about uh, what the residents found when they submitted their designation application and the significance of the La Alma Lincoln Park neighborhood. Um, so first starting with the, the history of the area. This was a really early immigrant working class neighborhood. It was established in the 1870s and 1880s uh, due to its um, relationship to the railroad and Burnham Yards and the related industries that were there. And so this was one of the first residential districts in residential neighborhoods in Denver. The neighborhood, uh, the architecture of the neighborhood is reflective of that early history. Um, we call it um, its vernacular history or vernacular architecture, which is really just the architecture of um, the average residence. When you think about, you know, there might be some uh, larger scale buildings up in Capitol Hill. Um, uh, you see a lot of the same styles that you would see up in the Cap Hill neighborhood um, in La Alma Lincoln Park but it was mainly architecture that was locally built. It was built, built by local laborers. It wasn't necessarily architectural designs, designed, um, but took details from the popular styles of the time. And so the architecture really reflects the community that resided in the neighborhood. And over time, the neighborhood uh, changed in makeup and community, and um, it became a resident uh, that were, was highly, um, the Latino community was, uh, was a large percentage of the population. And this neighborhood became really the center of the Chicano movement in the 1960s and 1970s. And so you see in both the architecture of the time, how it has evolved over time. And you also see um, in some of like you're seeing on the mural here, the, um, the, the, the change in residence and that this really became the heart of the Chicano movement in the city and county of Denver. And so the area is significant for its early history, for its architecture, and then significant as a historic cultural district for its importance in the Chicano movement. And we talk about this as having those layers of history, the period of significance for when this area was important. And it spans from 1873 to 1980. And so in, it includes um, multiple buildings across multiple eras. As you can see from these two photos, both are significant and important parts of the community, and they represent different eras of history in the La Alma Lincoln Park community. As the designation application was being put together, the community members did an inventory form or uh, for every building in the historic district. And so it talks a little bit um, about some of them have a little bit of history on the building and also talks a little bit about the architecture of the building. Uh, Landmark staff over the past, past uh, year or so has been working with community members to talk about customizing the design guidelines um, that would apply if this becomes a historic district. So throughout the city, there are a set of design guidelines. Um, it's citywide. But for this particular community, because it has such a long period of significance and it would be a proposed historic cultural district, we have uh, proposed a set of customized design guidelines. And what goes along with that is uh, Landmark staff looked at all of the buildings 
and um, called out the distinctive features of, um, of the properties in the Alma Lincoln Park. And so as you would be going forward with design review, which we'll go into in a little bit uh, further, uh, there, we have highlighted the characteristics that would, might be important to keep on the building. So um, at the bottom of each form, there is a distinctive features that would call out the important uh, characteristics of those buildings. So for our customized design guidelines, we wanted to talk a little bit about what does it mean for design review? If a property or, or a district is designated, uh, what does that mean for you as residents of the community? So anything within the boundary of the proposed district, um, if it is designated by Denver City Council, would go through design review. And what does that really mean for you on a practical level? So that means that properties are designated as is. If there is no requirement to improve or restore a property, um, you, we are not gonna make you make any changes if you don't wanna make changes to your building. There are a set of customized design guidelines that are intended to preserve the historic character of the district and the property, and to provide clear and predictable regulations for owners, applicants, and staff. The idea is to preserve the character of the building while also allowing uh, change and flexibility for the property owners. For buildings within the proposed district uh, that would be noted as contributing or um, having been built during the time period when um, from the 1870s to 1980s, the demolition of those buildings would be highly discouraged and would require review by the Landmark Preservation Commission. So what does that really boil down to and what are the things that we would review or not review? So Landmark would review any changes to the exterior of the building that requires a building or zoning permit. If you aren't already coming um, to community planning and development for a building permit, you wouldn't come to us. So that is um, new infill construction if you're building a brand new building, if you're putting an addition on or a garage, um, adding egress windows or window or door replacement, re-roofing, um, and then exterior alterations like electrical or mechanical fences and retaining walls um, and things like solar. Uh, also signage, but there's not a lot of commercial buildings in this particular district. The things we don't review. We don't review anything on the interior of the building. Um, no paint colors. Um, you can paint your house a delightful green and red Christmas colors if you would like, and we are not going to review that. Um, there's no repair or maintenance review. We wanna encourage the maintenance of a building. So you don't have to come to us for painting or minor replacement in kind of things. Uh, storm windows. We don't review any vegetation. So plants, trees, anything like that. That's not something that we review as well as anything below grade. If you had to upgrade some sort of plumbing um, underground, that's not something we're gonna take a look at. For La Alma Lincoln Park, as I had mentioned earlier, we've been working with a group of community members for about the past year or so to work on customizing our design guidelines specifically for this community. Um, our overall design guidelines would apply, uh, but there is going to be an appendix in there for La Alma Lincoln Park. And we particularly looked at two chapters within the, uh, within the design guidelines to customize. Um, what you see on the right is an image that you can find on our website that uh, shows um, all of the customization that we're proposing for uh, this proposed district. And um, my colleague Brittany here in a moment is gonna go over a little bit of what that might mean. Um, uh, but one of the things that we wanted to highlight um, is that because there are so many layers of history um, from 1873 to 1980, and it encompassed the, the cultural significance of the neighborhood, a lot of recent changes are historic. So historic materials um, would include stucco, vinyl, and permastone. Um, those were things that were used in 1980. And so there's a lot of flexibility for you guys um, if you are proposing changes to use those types of materials in your changes. And so one of the biggest changes to our design guidelines is to allow, to allow much greater flexibility in the materials that you might want to use. And so I'm going to transition to my colleague, Brittany. Um, she does a lot of design review and is one of our experts in our office on that. And I'm gonna let her talk about um, a little bit more specifics about design guidelines and what that might um, mean for you. 
So um, these customized design guidelines were really developed to capture what we heard from the community is important to preserve in the neighborhood um, and to protect those layers of history that really represent the cultural um, significance of the district. So we're gonna talk about how those design guidelines were customized. Um, so one of the first things we looked at is the variety of materials you see within the La Alma Historic District. Um, so generally speaking, when we're talking about our general guidelines, it talks about um, preserving original historic materials. Um, however, as La Alma has those layers of history, um, we have changed that to really capture the evolution of the district. So for here um, on this slide, you have three sister houses that really show that evolution of the um, historic district. So you have a home on the right that is very intact from the early period with those fish scale shingles, an original porch. Uh, you have a home in the middle who has um, a, a porch roof that is still original, but the columns are iron and from the 1950s. And in the primary gable face, you see a change in material. And then on the end of the blue house, that home has a, um, porch that is very indicative of the 1950s with perma stone. Um, the porch roof is a different shape and form. So really we want to preserve those layers of history that represent the evolution of the district. So we would encourage um, not covering decorative brick siding or wood features when they're present and preserving um, those original uh, materials that were added during the period of significance. So as Kara said, that can include perma stone um, and those kinds of things. Uh, so that is one of the changes we're proposing to make to the district. Um, another thing that we're proposing to customize is um, for doors. So there are not too many original doors within the La Alma Lincoln Park Historic District. However, the opening sizes um, do remain pretty original intact in the historic district. So when we're talking about doors, we really want that opening to remain, but you would have additional flexibility to replace the actual door, um, particularly on facades that aren't readily visible from the public right of way, you would have more flexibility to replace those doors. Um, so we really want to preserve opening size, but not so much the um, original door as there aren't too many original doors. Um, but if you do have an original door, it would be important to retain that because it does contribute to the character of the district. So that's another customization that we're looking at. A really big change from our general design guidelines would be how we treat um, windows. So on readily visible facades, so that would be a facade from the public right away, um, we would like you to preserve the position, number, and range, arrangement of windows on the primary facade. And just like doors, we heard from the neighborhood that the opening itself is really important. So if you have an arched opening, preserving that arch shape of that opening, but you may be able to change out the window that is in that opening and there would be some flexibility on materials. So in our other historic districts um, for historic buildings that are contributing, we generally require wood and aluminum clad wood windows. But here in La Alma, um, because you do see a variety of materials for those windows, we would allow additional flexibility um, for that as long as you're preserving the general opening of the window. So again, that's just the shape of the window, maybe not necessarily the window itself, unless it's what we call a character um, defining window and that would be something with stained glass on the primary facade. And there are a few of those in the district. So there is a lot of flexibility for window alterations in this district. <clears throat> Another change that we're uh, proposing is um, alternate materials for porches. 
Um, so generally speaking, in our other historic districts, we require porches to be reconstructed to um, their original footprint and their original materials, which is generally wood or brick. Um, here we would allow some composite materials, so that includes Trex decking um, and those types of materials. And the reason why we want to provide that flexibility in this district is because porches are very important to this district. A lot of homes have porches and they're really public gathering spaces that contribute to the um, character of the district. So we really want to make sure that porches remain an integral part of the district and we provide flexibility on how those porches can be repaired and maintained. Um, and then finally, another big change that we're proposing is uh, flexibility in terms of fencing material. Um, this is uh, because in the district you see a variety of fencing material that varies um, from chain link to brick to raw iron, and they really um, contribute to the character of the neighborhood. Um, so we are giving a lot of flexibility in terms of what types of materials you can use for fencing. Uh, generally speaking, front yard fences should be no taller than 48 inches, and that's a zoning requirement. And rear yard fences um, should be no taller than six feet. So that's something that comes from zoning, um, and that's not something so much from a landmark perspective that we have uh, that much flexibility on. So keep that in mind is also we're working within the terms of what is required for in the zoning code. Um, but we would allow um, chain link within this district, which is not something that we typically allow in our uh, other historic districts. Um, we would also allow brick stone and stucco columns with a combination of materials. Um, we don't wanna see vinyl fencing though in this district. So um, that is because we don't really see vinyl fencing historically in this district. So that's something we would discourage. Um, we do also like to see fencing be somewhat open in the front yard. And that's really so we can maintain views into um, the historic homes. In our other historic districts, we say fencing should be 50% um, open, but we're not being that uh, strenuous here, uh, but we still would like an open nature fencing because that's what you see in the surrounding context. And so that's another customization that um, we are proposing for this district. Um, so those are generally some of the customizations that we have proposed and these um, Customizations really came from uh, small working group meetings that what we were hearing as landmark staff is important to the neighborhood and the character of the neighborhood. And really this is to, again, help preserve those layers of history that Kara talked about that are identified on those inventory forms as contributing to the cultural significance of the district. Um, so I'm gonna hand it back off to Kara now. Thank you, Brittany, for that um, it was good, good, good overview. And I see there's a lot of stuff in the chat as well. So we will try to get to that as well as everyone's questions. Um, but wanted to let you guys know that um, uh, if you have additional or additional questions, we wanted to find a couple of places for you to find the information. So you can go to our website where there's some information there. Um, there's also a survey on the website to provide your opinion on uh, the historic uh, historic cultural district and if you would like to go forward with that. And we will put a link in the chat to both of those here in a moment. And then also wanted to let you know that if you have questions and would like to uh, talk to Landmark staff uh, more one-on-one, -on -one, please feel free to email either our general Landmark inbox number um, or email me directly and we can set up a time um, to talk if you have any more specific questions, we would be happy to, um, to answer those for you. And so we're going to move into our Q&A section, but uh, before we move into that, we would like to provide the opportunity to a couple of our um, uh, members of the community and um, residents uh, of the area who have worked on the designation application and came forward with that. So if you give me one moment, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And then um, I believe that um, Emmanuel Martinez is on the line. If 
um, if he would like to uh, speak as to the importance of the of the district. And then I believe Fatima is also on the line. And so if you guys both would like to speak to that, we would um, love to hear from uh, people who have come forward uh, with the designation. So Emmanuel, please uh, take it away. Oh, well, thank you for allowing me to say something today. Can you hear me okay? Uh, well, you know, I, first of all, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, I, 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 I was, a, I'm a, De a Denver a native, uh, born around the Five Points area, and I've lived in uh, both East Denver and North Denver, and, and also West Denver during the late 60s and early 70s. And uh, I'm a visual artist who has painted uh, the first murals there at the park. And actually, they're, they're not only the first in, in the park, uh, but also the first in the state and even the country. We did our first murals uh, in, in Denver in 1968 and there in the community in, you know, in, the, in 1970, 71. So we, uh, you, you know, we, we go back quite a ways uh, in, in that particular community. And I was a, also an activist in the Chicano movement there and very much a part of that. But uh, my, my, my message is essentially to the, the newcomers that uh, have moved into the community uh, over the last 10 years or so. Uh, I, 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 I just really, I want to make a plea to you to, uh, to to realize, you know, the importance and historical significance this means to this community. Uh, we, uh, we we've been uh, even at that time in the in the late sixties and early seventies, we we made a very special effort to try to uh, beautify our neighborhoods uh, and and keep out uh, you, you know certain businesses uh, like, for example, in Santa Fe they at the Epsilon Theater, which used to be the Santa Fe Theater there. They, somebody bought that and wanted to turn it into a triple X porno type of uh, place. And we were able to stop them from doing that in our community. And so we we go way back you know, also to the Auraria, uh, trying to, to prevent that. But, uh, but getting back to, to the, the new uh, community residents there, uh, we we just are, are asking you to, uh, to to consider some you know the benefits of, of doing this. Uh, have a little empathy and respect for our in our past uh, cultural contributions to the area. Uh, many of our people uh, have had to move out of the community because of the uh, soaring cost of, of, of living there. But you know our, our our hearts and our initial efforts, you know, should not be uh, forgotten. Uh, we we should, uh, you know, we should be acknowledged and and not erased from this history. You know, that has happened too much in the Denver area, as you all know. Well, how gentrification has been eliminate, eliminating a lot of the cultural, valuable. Uh, uh, values and assets in in the, in the community, and we just this is our kind of last chance uh, in, in Denver, and hopefully the Five Points will also get designation historical uh, significance that we're trying to get here. So uh, we we just uh, uh, please please uh, just try to make an effort, if not if nothing else, try to you could research and 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 do a little homework on for you. Where you're living and and, and try to uh, understand where we're coming from. You know, it, it's very important for us uh, to, to not see this uh, last part of the Denver become, uh, you know, another uh, uh, you know gentrified place with uh, a lot of our beautiful uh, houses and that uh, destroyed and, and and turned into these contemporary. Uh, office looking buildings and I I would just uh, urge you to please support this uh, effort that we have been trying to make uh, actually for decades and uh, and and 
you know, we, you know, you, you've heard just even in this presentation, all the, the many benefits uh, that this will have for you. So uh, I, I, I just want to make the plea to, to, to have, to please support this uh, effort. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, uh, Fatima, if you, um, as one of the early um, community members who have been, have been working on the designation, if you would uh, like to speak to that for a moment. Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Fatima Birchi, and I'm here with Allison Crabtree. Um, we started this little fledgling project almost four years ago, and I think Shannon Stage can attest to the amount of time and effort that we um, have put into this uh, little, little, not little anymore, but really significant project. Um, our efforts really were to sort of look at why this community and this actual neighborhood was so uh, interesting to live in. We had moved from Boulder and we wanted to be part of a more diverse um, demographic, which, which Lila Malincoln Park represents that. You know, if you think about the history of um, La Alma, it's about immigrants who came from other parts of the country and perhaps from uh, across across the oceans to find themselves, you know, in a place where they could um, strive and, you know, be welcome. Um, and I think that's what we felt when we moved from, uh, you know, from Boulder County to, to Denver, that there was a welcoming that we were really excited to to be part of. It would be that opportunity to wave to your neighbor from the porch. It would be that opportunity to walk down the street and say hi to somebody and, you know, uh, marvel at their kind of welcoming nature. Um, and so part of that is also to do with how, you know, the, the housing stock is set up so that you can actually do that. There, the, the buildings have setbacks, they, there are front porches, there are gardens, Nothing is just all the way up to the lot line, which is sometimes, you know, difficult to have connections with communities and neighbors. I think one of the really interesting things is that um, uh, while we were kind of going through this, this research, we, we understood how little representation this community had as far as the activism that grew out of this uh, La, La Alma. And that research was super interesting to find out about and really you know you felt a connection because somewhere in our lives we've all been there where we've not had uh, a sense of equity or we've not had a sense of affordability and and we're trying to say that these communities actually provide that for for a lot of people uh, a household with 750 square feet can have four people or five people in it as opposed to a thousand, 2,000 square foot, you know, a new build that has one or two people in it. So not only does that density provide the vibrance in that community, in the community, but it also uh, enables people to stay in their homes, to have, you know, affordable housing, which is something that is a real issue in the Denver metro area at the moment. Um, I, I have to say, I have done, along with the committee me team members, and I want to just acknowledge them, if they're online, Felix Herzog, uh, Allison Crabtree, David Griggs, and um, myself, and of course, Historic Dan Denver, Annie and, and Shannon, who have been stellar in helping us through, you know, the, the, the legalese of how you kind of do this process. Um, I, the little flyers that you saw there on when, when Kara put them up is that I designed those and, <laughs> you know, I'm so, I'm so glad that you, you had the ice cream cone there because we had an ice cream social. We had, you know, a community meeting in um, with DHA's um, great spaces that they have available for community events. Uh, I think that sort of starts to so show you that this community can is connected and, and people know each other and they say hi to each other and they hang out on the porch or they hang out on the fence. You know, and they gave each other cake or cookies or something like that. That's something that I could never do in uh, another context. And I come from very strong South Asian roots where neighborhood and family are everything. I mean, if you didn't have that network, it would be hard to get through some difficult times. So all that flyering, um, we've had people who had been skeptical, but have talked to Kara at her office and to Shannon and have understood that Nobody's trying to fossilize this neighborhood. 
this isn't about you know putting like a plastic seal over it and nothing can happen it's actually about an organic growth from the beginnings in the early 1800s to where it is right now and that organic growth i think needs to be told as a story it's a story of people who were coming from other places striving found their voices through uh, an activist movement have contributed to you know the history of denver that um, sometimes is overlooked because it doesn't have let's say the kind of overall uh, i would say grandeur grandeur of let's say curtis park or uh, you know or wash park um, it's about a diversity and a demographic that's very diverse as well and we've met some new people who have come into our neighborhood and we've been super excited to tell them about the history and they've been really stunned that they didn't know that this was this was actually an important kind of um, sort of beginning of Denver. So I urge you, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to contact Kara at her office. They've done a stellar job in kind of documenting all this information for us, Shannon and Annie at Historic Denver. Um, nobody's putting any shackles on anybody. We're just asking to be respectful of the proportions of the buildings, to be respectful of setbacks. Improvements are going to happen. You, 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 know, you know you're going to need a new bathroom in there, and of course. <laughs> you know, an ADU is designed in the zoning for this particular neighborhood. So, you know, yes, you can definitely consider uh, additional space. Um, but more than that, I think, you know, you're going to be so excited to to meet people in this neighborhood. It's it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to actually come back to this idea of uh, neighborhood and community. Um, and I'm gonna stop talking because I think I'm gonna break down here. <laughs> so <laughs> please, and if you have any questions of me, you may also uh, email me. And I think, um, you know, uh, historic, uh, historic Committee for La Alma Lincoln Park has all the links to all our, our um, emails. Thank you. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you, Fatima, for sharing. Um, we wanted to open it up to questions from the community. I see that um, Helen has raised her hand if she would like uh, uh, to speak. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to say that some of our members had uh, difficulty getting on. Uh, I told them to call in uh, Farida, uh, Archuleta, uh, and um, Ed Sandoval. Uh, could not uh, navigate the, the the links and I'm not sure why. So anyway, I hope they're there. I told them to call in. Uh, I do want to say, uh, first of all, I'm glad that Emmanuel spoke um, and Fathima when we're recognizing the importance, the cultural importance of this community and, uh, and to recognize, uh, some of you go back to the immigrants, which is okay. Uh, that did come from all over, but the, the Northern Cheyenne and the um, Rapaho were here long before that. Uh, in fact, camped down there, right in that community, uh, their camps were down there. Um, and uh, so, you know, we always got to recognize, recognize that, 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 that we're on their land, okay? Uh, and still legally, by the way, with the Treaty of 1851 uh, that was never honored. Uh, but I do want to uh, stress the importance because I was part of that movement along with Emmanuel um, as a young girl. And, uh, you know, we fought. We fought for equality uh, in education. Um, you know, we, we uh, as a springboard to go on and, and fight for civil rights uh, in Denver. Uh, and in fact, it was the spark uh, of, the, of the city and the civil rights movement. So I just think the cultural and historical preservation, I, I am just so proud to say that, that I was part of that history. And I'm hoping that Parida and Ed, uh, since they are, you know, I've been there, uh, I mean, I lived there uh, and I know the history of that, of that community for the last 50 years. Um, but if Parida and Ed are on the line, I really would appreciate if they would speak up. And they're on the phone, so I don't know how that works. Thank you, Helen. Um, I see the next hand is Shannon, and then we'll go to um, anyone on the phone. Oh, okay. 
I also wanted to uh, note that Kathy Pietro and Lucha Martinez yes. are on the call as well and have been very much a part of, um, definitely a part of the Chicano movement uh, with Kathy being very involved uh, as well as Lucha being involved, um, both of them being involved in this project overall. So wanted to open it up to both of them um, to Go speak ahead. as well. Go ahead, Mom. Hi, um, am I on? Yes, you are. We can yes. hear you. Okay. okay. Uh, hey, Kathy. I'm, hey, you got what's going on? My name is Kathy Prieto, and uh, I just want to say, you know, thank you for allowing us to to go ahead and pull all this together with you all. But you know, I was kind of talking about. I was talking to my daughter Desi about um, the change that's coming to our area. Um, what do they call it? The twenties, twenty ones. I, you know, I, I never understood that. I understand change, but these houses these days that are moving into our area are looking like apartments with um, patios on the top of the roof. Um, you want a patio, go downtown. Um, I, I love my neighborhood and I'm praying that there's not gonna be no more new addition to it. So save us if you can. You know, we can't even, uh, even that. So. you know, I used to look, go out my back door and look at the mountains. Yeah. Can't even do that anymore. But, um, you know, whatever little bit we've got left, I, I take my hat off to you all and, and uh, save our people's land, keep it the way it is. You know, we've been there, we've done that. I've been here since the late fifties, uh, moved into this house in the late sixties but always been in West Denver all my life. And uh, we tried to do a lot of good for our, you know, as a, as a teenager, I was trying to, to, uh, to do something good with the, with the kids that were my age. And uh, that was put to a halt. But uh, hopefully we all get together and, and, um, maintain what we have this is our land you know and and we'd like to keep it this way you know and i thank you all very much and take care amen oh i would just like to say that uh, my mom my grandma and grandpa bought this house in 1969 um my mother lives here now and um i know florida's lived down the street forever as well um and uh, and Howlin lived here for a long time. Um, a lot of the people in this neighborhood are like family, and like because of the inflation, everybody's had to move out. It's really a drag because it's like um, we brought, we lost some of our family members. But um, my mom can't even look outside and see the mountains anymore. They're putting up so many skyscrapers and buildings, and um, for all the, these people here. Um, when are they going to put a stop to that? It, it's ridiculous already. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for um, providing your input. Um, I um, wanted to provide an opportunity for other people to ask questions if you'd like to raise your hand. Um, but I believe I was looking through the chat and um, Dave had a question on um, the murals in the in the neighborhood. Um, the designation application uh, really explicitly calls out the importance of the murals, um, how integral they were to the Chicano movement and the start of the movement, um, and the importance of, the, of them to the neighborhood. Um, unfortunately, uh, the city and county of Denver, um, through landmark designation, cannot require the preservation of murals. Uh, there are some First Amendment uh, rights that go along with that. And so while we have been um, working with um, members of the community to talk about are there ways that we can preserve, this, preserve them, this is a, a nationwide um, issue that other cities are facing and we are working to find methods to help protect and preserve the murals. But unfortunately, this designation not, would not um, require the preservation of those murals. Um, it highlights their importance um, and there are a couple of murals that are on city and county of Denver buildings, um, particularly La Alma on the rec center, 
both interior and exterior. If you can see Shannon's, what is behind Shannon's head, um, through our conversations with uh, Parks and Rec, they recognize um, the importance of the mural and have um, every intention of retaining it. Um, but unfortunately, it's not something that we can um, require. And I see that Lucha has raised her hand and Lucha is someone who is um, intimately involved in this. And I'm gonna uh, let her uh, speak a little bit further to um, the preservation of murals. Thank you, Kara. Yeah, I'm um, director of the Chicano Murals of Colorado project. And I just wanted to um, let everybody know that we are actively working on this also with other um, other organizations throughout the country, but the reality is, um, I, uh, Kara has mentioned that there is no law in place, but that doesn't mean that one cannot exist. There has to be a way to protect our murals. They're significant to us, they're our visual legacy, and the reality is we're going to challenge all preservation historic districts uh, and organizations to stop thinking outside of the box and really accommodate our needs as well. These laws are in place to, to recognize a certain um, demographic and the reality is we don't fit in that box, but eventually they're going to have to start considering what is important to us and what we value. And I wanted to add to that as well, um, Kara mentioned that it, the murals within the district boundary are uh, character defining features and I, sorry, I should introduce myself, Shannon Stage with Historic Denver, who has been working on the project with the neighborhood. Um, so it is a part, it is uh, character defining features as a part of the district uh, uh, application. Um, but as Kara mentioned, there's no specific laws within the landmark district that can specifically protect them. But that's not to say that we're not going to continue to have these conversations with the city landmarks, with other city departments, including Lucha having been working on um, the preservation of Chicano murals for quite a while. Um, and, you know, Historic Denver is involved in this conversation as well to try and figure out either laws or regulations or ways to help protect them in the future. So, um, you know, even though it is a part of the district and technically the district can't protect and preserve it, that conversation will continue to be had even after this district, if it is um, approved, when and that is, goes through, that conversation will continue to be had, how to protect and preserve the Chicano murals. Thank you, Shannon and Lucha. I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, could could you recognize that Sandoval? He's trying to get through through phone. Is um, he on the phone right now, Helen? Yes, he's on the phone. He says he can't comment, but he's on the phone. Could, um, do you happen to know the last three digits of um, oh, I, that number? And we can. I do, um, uh, let me let me check real quick. Because uh, he's emailing me and telling me he's trying to get through uh, 499. Okay, I'm going to um, uh, ask him to unmute. So I've done that on, the, on, the, on our end. Um, Ed, you can also, I believe, hit star six to unmute. Yeah. I believe you're able, Ed, if you're there, you. Uh, uh, Hello, Ed, please feel free and um, uh, voice, your, voice your comment. Okay, now can you hear me? Yes, excellent, thank you, go, go ahead. Okay, um, now um, I was 13 in 1967 when my family moved from Pueblo into the South Lincoln Park projects, which were located just immediately south of, of uh, Lalma Park. Uh, my, I was not an activist until uh, um, maybe 10 years ago myself. My mother, Agapita Sandoval, was an activist on the west side. Um, she was involved in, uh, in, in the movement to, uh, uh, to change the name of, of Lincoln Park to Lalma Park. She was involved in a lot of things going on on the west side at that time, um, and uh, a lot of our, a lot of us in this neighborhood, 
have uh, have been trying to uh, for decades have been trying to to not only change the name to to the Alma Park, but to drop the Lincoln part of that name. And uh, over the years, uh, the name was changed from Lincoln Park to the Alma slash Lincoln Park. But um, some of us are still trying to, you know, are thinking that's not good enough. There is already a Lincoln Park in Denver. Um, between the state capitol building and the civic center, there's a park that's called Lincoln Park. Um, and that, that's one of the things that that's one point that that, that we've made over the years that that uh, this this park should be called La Alma Park because that's the name that we chose as a community. Um, another thing that a lot of people haven't haven't talked about is. Uh, I, I'm, I'm an Apache, and uh, um, Helen was talking about how the, these are still the homelands of the Arapaho, and, and uh, you know we we have uh, a lot of a lot of us um, Indians have have tried to we we don't we don't appreciate the name Lincoln. To us, it doesn't mean the same thing that it does to everybody. During the Dakota Wars, um, Lincoln was the president at that time, and uh, there were some some uh, Dakotas that were at the end of the wars when 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 the the government forces uh, uh, put down an insurrection. They arrested uh, they arrested scores of, of Dakotas, and they had a they had a kangaroo trial for them. Um, there were 40 of them who were condemned to death. 38 of them were hanged in, a ma in the biggest mass hanging by the government in, in history. And so we, we Indians, when we think of Lincoln, that's what comes to mind, how he participated in the genocide of our people. And uh, we don't want we don't want to use that name Lincoln for this park, um, and, and that's something that I that I would like to 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 see changed if possible. Thank you, Ed, for for sharing that. We 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 appreciate your your comments on that and your um, thoughtful observations about that. Um, uh, as a I, I oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, I apologize for uh, from uh, working with Landmark. Um, my background isn't in uh, parks and the name changing, um, but we will look into that. And I, I want to, um, although it's outside our purview, and I hate to give the answer as a city employee that I don't know the answer yet, but we will um, continue to look into that. Um, are there any other questions that we can answer as Landmark staff? I have a correction to make there. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, that Lincoln Park that's uh, in front of the Capitol uh, that he referred to, uh, that's between Lincoln and Broadway. They call it Lincoln Park because Lincoln runs across it, but its official name is Veterans Park. And maybe the state or something should up a prominent sign there stating that that open space of land, which is often filled in with our downtown festivals, it should be its Veterans Park. I'm sure that's the official name of it. Now, as far as Lincoln go, uh, President Lincoln goes, uh, yeah, there, uh, the, that Sand Creek massacre occurred while he was president. Uh, at that time, the communications were uh, were pretty bad, uh, you know, going out west, and uh, the, um, uh, the even the Pony Express uh, didn't come in until slightly after that. Uh, the uh, uh, so. Uh, uh, there was an investigation of some atrocities by the uh, uh, soldiers who patrolled the Western uh, la uh, provinces or land. There was, they weren't states at the time. And uh, I, I don't know what happened, uh, what kind of prosecutions were made at all, but I do know that Congress heard some words that weren't very good about what was going on out West and uh, the Wild West Cowboys and all that. And they, uh, and so maybe some history could be brought up as to 
what uh, Congress did in terms of their investigations back in the 1850s, 60s, and 70s. That's all I have to say. Uh, thank you, Matt. I, I, I appreciate your comment. Thank you. Um, I see that there was a question in the uh, chat. Um, in case anyone else didn't see it, I wanted to bring that up. Um, a question about uh, tax credits um, and what is the minimum threshold of that? If either Abby or Brittany would like to speak maybe just a little bit more about tax credits, how those work, and then the minimum threshold for that. Sure, I'm happy to talk about those a little bit. I did put in the chat, the minimum threshold is 5,000. So your project, you need to be spending at least 5,000. So there's certain items that qualify for the tax credit. So basically it's anything related to the maintenance of the historic property, do we work to maintain historic fabric? So on the exterior, that would be anything like repointing your brick, repairing your brick, repairing a historic foundation, replacing your roof. On the inside, things like refinishing or replacing hardwood floors, refinishing or repairing um, other features, a fireplace, mantles, historic doors would all qualify. Um, restoring windows would qualify for the tax credit. And then the tax credit also includes building systems. The idea being that you know to provide funding to help with you know project upgrades to modernize the home and make it more livable. So that would include any work you needed to do on new plumbing, HVAC, electrical. Um, those would be qualifying cost for the tax credit as well. Um, there is a staggered fee system to apply for the tax credit that is based on the total amount that you were spending on a project. So the minimum fee is $250. It goes up based on you know, the amount of the project. There is, so the tax credit is generally 20% of the amount spent on the project. Sometimes if there's disaster area declarations that can get, there's also in there that if your county currently has a disaster area declaration, it can get up to 25% that you're eligible for. Um, there is a cap, so the max amount that you can get back as a tax credit is $50,000. Thank you, Abby. Um, uh, are there any other questions or anything that Landmark staff can ask, or are there things that I have missed in the chat um, that, um, that we haven't addressed? I've been trying to simultaneously look at both while talking. Um, if any of my colleagues would like to chime in, or there are any other questions. Kara, do you want to address um, uh, possible office hours and how that will work after today? With yes, you? yes, sure. Um, so if anyone would like to uh, set up office hours with us as Landmark staff, um, please email me um, at um, kara.han at denvergov.org. I will add that to the, to the chat. Um, uh, we had had a sign up genius in, um, there were some snafus with um, all of the sign up genius emails getting uh, sent away and not coming to my, um, um, to my personal email. So I wanted to just simplify that and let people just email me directly and we'll work to set up some times with people if you have um, any questions. Um, and I will enter my info into the chat here for everyone. Uh, I just like to make one last comment um, because I think there's one thing it is being overlooked. I don't think it's purposely done, but I, I noticed when Matt and um, Ed Sandoval were talking, you know, you're really bringing through this project, you're bringing the history, the indigenous history of uh, all the natives uh, that lived in the West Side. Uh, and, you know, before it was really the West Side or even before it was really Denver. Um, I'm really proud of that fact. And, and I really, um, I, I, I I listened to Ed and to uh, to Matt and saying, yeah, they're going to bring that they're going to bring that history into the into this project. Anyway, but thank you guys for your for your effort. Thank you. I have, a, I have a oh. few things, Kara. Um, they're <laughs> not really related to design guidelines. I see a bunch of questions about park names <laughs> going around. And while this isn't related to Denver Landmark at all, so. Uh, the park in front of the Capitol is official name is Lincoln Park. There is a house bill going through right now to rename it to Lincoln 
um, Veterans Memorial Park, I believe. Um, and then Veterans Park, as noted in the chat, is south of Wash Park, just for clarity's sake, since I see some comments going around about it. Um, but again, that's not something that's within our purview or anything that we have control over. <laughs> but there is a house bill going through right now to rename the park in front of the Capitol. Um, so. Thank you, Brittany. I do have one comment to make there. That Lincoln or Veterans Park or whatever you want to call it, that space of land, that is state property. That is not city and county property. So the city and county of Denver can't say, well, we're going to name that this or that uh, park or name it after, uh, say, Sandoval or Sandoval Park or, or some other notable. Uh, it's state land. And as far as I knew, uh, the state refers to it as Veterans Park. And there might be a, a city and county uh, Veterans Park elsewhere. But that uh, there, I, we should the, the ownership is definitely different. It's just like the state capital grounds is also state lands. That's all. And and again, there's a house bill going through right now to officially name it Lincoln Veterans Memorial Park. So. Great. Thank you guys for the update. Um, I see uh, in the chat from Erin, and I'm going to direct this to Shannon because I think she can be the best person to coordinate this. Is um, how to get involved with people who have been working on this project since 2017. Um, so Shannon, I'll direct that to you. I was actually just typing in the chat um, my email address. So Erin and anyone else on the call, um, I will put my email address in the chat, but I can also say it here for any of you on the phone as well. Please feel free to email me and I can connect you up with those individuals with the community and within the boundary um, that has been working on this project. Uh, so my email address is sstage, S-T-A-G-E, at historicdenver.org. So I'm with Historic Denver, the preservation nonprofit here, um, have been working very closely with the community as well as with the city uh, landmark staff. So again, I'll put that in the chat as well for those of you on the computer. Um, so please feel free to email me and I can connect you up with the rest of the community members that have been working on this. Um, I'm sure they will definitely want to have, you know, it's been a great experience over the last four years. Um, each community meeting been growing and growing that community group that has been working on it. And, um, you know, getting to know more and more individuals, former and current residents. So it's been a really, uh, really cool project to be able to get to know this community, um, one community meeting at a time, just growing that number. So uh, definitely happy to connect you up with them. I also wanted to bring to your attention, Kara, the question that um, has the date for city council meeting been set? If not, do we know, or do you know a timeline for when those public hearings um, will start or or when or how you'll you'll announce those meeting dates? Yeah, sure, that, that, that's a great question. So um, so the, the first meeting that would occur is for the Landmark Preservation Commission. Uh, that will be June 15th. Um, in the next week or so, you'll be getting some letters from the city of Denver with some information about that meeting and how to participate. It is a um, public hearing, so anyone who wants to um, provide comment are welcome to attend and comment on that. And then if, a, if recommended for approval by the Landmark Preservation Commission, it would go before Denver Planning Board, and then after that, it would go forward um, to Denver City Council, and there would be a series of four meetings before Denver City Council, um, culminating in a public hearing um, that would likely be in August. Uh, so that's sort of a rough, um, a rough, a rough overview of the time frame. Um, we will have all of the information on how to participate and the dates um, will be available on our website. And I will, after I finish talking, we'll add that to the chat. Um, that you can uh, take a look at and find the upcoming dates. And again, I um, wanted to reiterate, if you have any questions um, or want to provide any comment, you can email them to me. Um, also, there is a survey um, online uh, that we at the, that the city is hosting that we would encourage anyone to provide their opinions and thoughts on the proposed historic district. And so we would encourage you all to participate in that as well. The information for that survey will be going before Landmark Preservation Commission 
um, and then if it's recommended forward to, to the Denver Planning Board and then ultimately to Denver City Council. So please um, feel free to um, provide any information there. Um, are there and any I just put that survey in the chat, Kara. So awesome. um, I know someone put it up earlier in the chat, but it's right there now for anyone that wants to click on it. Okay, great, thank you. Um, are there any other questions that we can answer? And if not, I wanted to thank everyone for coming, but wanted to provide one last um, call for answers. Um, so since you have three landmarks back here. Uh, Kara, I just want, there's a question in the email about the next, is there another community meeting that is going to be uh, set up or is this uh, uh, one of the last ones or just, just a sense of whether there are more community meetings for people to participate in? So this is the, this is the last community meeting that's sort of an unofficial meeting. Um, I believe that the, um, the residents and applicants will also be doing another round of Flyering and um, uh, door knocking to, for the community between now and the um, Landmark Preservation Commission meeting on June 15th, if I am understanding that correctly. Um, but the next community meeting um, would be the Landmark Preservation Commission public hearing on June 15th. And like I said, there will be um, uh, letters that will be going out to everyone here in the next week and a half or so that you'll be receiving those. Um, and then just so no one is surprised, um, there will be um, big signs that we put up around the boundary of the district um, that will be put up as a way to um, provide additional notification to the to the community. But just so no one's surprised if you see a, a sign that's um, in um, that's being put up that that that's what that's for. Um, so good. Uh, th thank you, Fatima, for bringing for bringing it up and make, allowing me to clarify for that. It's okay. It's so great to see so many people out, um, supporters, um, people who have been with this project for so long, uh, new folks who have come into the neighborhood. Great to see all of you and hear from you. Um, I look forward to you know interacting with you in the next month here while we're at flyering and knocking on doors and saying hello. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and thank you everyone for joining. We really appreciate um, your attendance. Um, and, and your participation in the meeting. Again, if you have any questions, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to either Landmark staff or uh, Shannon with Historic Denver. We'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. And thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your uh, Saturday afternoon. It looks like there's still a little bit of sunshine before it might rain this afternoon. So thank you everyone and have a good day.